say the band has changed over the last decade both in terms of your sound and maybe how you compare now to what your original vision was for the band we were so friggin earnest at the beginning um, and we still have I think uh, innocence to our music uh, an underlying innocence but at the same time we've also lived a lot and I think our hearts have expanded and um, a lot of us have kids now and have found the loves of our lives and We've uh, lost friends along the way, and um, so I feel like we all have a bigger capacity for sorrow and love, and, um, and that's reflected in our music. I think sonically, too, we've, you know, we added drums about six years ago. That was, that was a really big shift. You know, we had a full-time mandolin player up until that point. He left. Uh, rather than add another mandolin player, we added uh, drums. That changed, our whole, that changed the whole concept. I think it took us a couple years to really figure out how to... Um, perform with drums. It's just such a different, um, a different ball game. And but we, you know, we kept to otherwise acoustic instruments with pickups. Um, so making those two things fit together is a really tricky, uh, really tricky game. Really happy for our drummer Lucas uh, Carlton, who's finding new drums to use and new ways to play them, so that there's room for these things to to speak. Um, otherwise, all the mid range just gets lost in the cymbals, and you're kind of listening to like. The attack of the banjo and mm-hmm. nothing else. You know, the acoustic guitar sounds super tinny. It's it's just it's a really tough tough thing to play loud, play with drums, and also play acoustic. You know, but I think that that it makes sense in the context of hot butter drum to have the drums. Um, yeah. You know, when you see our bass player Brian play, he he plays really great in the string band context mm-hmm. too. But um, I would say that his playing has really been able to expand since uh, Lucas came in, and there. They're two peas in a pod. I mean, the two of them have such great musical chemistry. 
that just lays this fat groove for anything else to happen. Um, so yeah, I think that the, the drums have allowed uh, Brian Horn especially to expand what he does. I was wondering, you know, how you guys maybe individually changed your approach or adapted your approach when you added the drummer. And specifically for Dobro, which I play Dobro probably every fifth or sixth song. I play a lot of, probably more banjo and then also some woodwinds and stuff. But um, I added a humbucker pickup and we got a drummer because I needed more sustain to carry up over that over the cymbals and just love the sound. All, but all of a sudden, I could use more. Um, lap steel type tone with the drums that didn't doesn't make sense as much with the string band and then for banjo I've just kind of noticed I mean for better or for worse I just end up playing at more of a loud steady volume as opposed to expecting to be able to get that kind of swell that I can get when I'm not playing with drums it's just a really different ball game and I just I play differently I just play a lot more steady streams of notes on the banjo I don't try to do some of the more intricate single string stuff because it just doesn't it doesn't carry as much when there's drums on stage. I would say there's still places for that, but it's not the predominant thing that you're doing. Um, yeah, also for the guitar, um, it changes the role of the guitar a lot. Um, in a string band, the the guitar is sort of the ride symbol. I would say it, it fills in a lot of the shimmery mid range, upper mid range, and um, so with with the drums, I feel like I can lighten up a little bit and leave more space, which, which I love doing and kind of pick little moments to uh, add, add in my, my thing. Um, so I like, I like that part of it. I, I also love playing in string bands. We, we all play in side project mm -hmm. string bands and that is still where I want to keep cutting my teeth and, and getting better. And uh, I, I, lo I love playing in string bands. But as far as the hot butter drum trajectory, um, this, this is where it's at. Uh, we're gonna do a tune called The Love You Gave Away. This is off our most recent uh, eponymous release.
you all three write songs uh, for the band. How much of it is collaborative and how much is, is like each individual bringing in a song and then you know having the other guys listen to it and work on it later? Or do you, do you ever sit down and write songs together? Usually not from the ground up. We usually sort of uh, sprout the seeds on our own and then bring them together at uh, various stages of sprouting. Um, we, um, I, I think what Hop at a Drum does really well is is take these songs from like 60 or 70% mm -hmm. to 100%. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where we found our groove together. Um, and the 100% version has stamps of each band member's opinions and musical always. tastes on yeah. it in good ways. And, and always morphs, actually. Yeah. I mean, it, I, it was still songs we play today. So, hey, how about in this song we hold that for two more beats or put another right. chord in there or something like that, and it becomes the you know a sculpture it is after a while. You know? Endless. Yeah, we're um, but I've I've also written songs with both these guys uh, from the ground up. Mm -hmm. Aaron and I have a great song called Cougar. Cougar. It's one of the best songs ever. Yeah. Uh, and Eric and I just wrote that song Weary Ways that we played for you. Mm -hmm. And um, I love doing that too. It's 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 really challenging. You uh, end up. Um, it's it's somehow a bigger risk. It's it's maybe even a bigger investment of energy, and and sometimes it blows up in your face, and and sometimes it's awesome. This here is a beard resonator. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about it? Uh, mahogany. Uh, it's about eight years old. Um, like I said, I do have the humbucker pickup here. Um, I had to cut a little bit into the um, in the metal, but not in the wood. And I blend that with the McIntyre feather that's on the tone comb. <laughs> I've just been really happy with the sound. I, I got it because of its kind of dark, um, dark tone. Usually if I know I'm going to plug an instrument in, starting with my banjo is the same way, starting with the darker tones better because mm -hmm. the pickups tend to bring out the, the highs and the high mids. So um, that's been my, my journey. I didn't, I didn't plan on being a dobro player on stage. I just got it for myself, but it's worked its way into the band. Pretty consistently. Nice, and then not pictured here, you have uh, the banjo as a Neckville, right? Yeah, I have a Neckville classic. Um, Tom Neckville makes great, great banjos, electric fan acoustics. So, been really happy with um, that. It's been really reliable, easy to work on on the road, um, and yeah, really good sounding instrument. Super, and then uh, Nat, you have your trusty Santa Cruz with you, mm -hmm. um, and I guess. Uh, you had a chance to meet Richard Hoover of Santa Cruz, and he he uh, helped you uh, to work on that one. Right? Yeah, yeah, I met him at uh, Wintergrass at the Bluegrass Festival in Seattle, and um, I wasn't even looking for a new instrument. Especially, I was happy with my Martin, and he's like, "Hey, you know, I saw your set. Uh, you should play one of these and play one of these and play one of these." And he saw, "Well, we could do this custom thing for you, where we could you could you know make up whatever you want." I'm like, "Well, okay." And so um, it was cool. It was like this ongoing conversation where I'd go and play different Santa Cruz models and say, well, I like this about that. I like this about that. Mm -hmm. And then they put it together. And it was like dealing with these high priests of, of uh, Lutherism. And they absolutely slayed it. I love it. The Lutheran priests. Yeah, <laughs> Lutheran priests. Uh, and they're, they're awesome guys down there at, at the factory. And uh, they, they gave me a tour. And, uh, they sometimes come to our shows when we play in San Francisco, mm -hmm. and um, it's uh, turned out to be a great instrument. Uh, Aaron, you, you wrote a, a piece called The Ten Reasons Why Trey Was the Perfect Choice for the uh, Grateful Dead uh, Farewell Shows. My question for you is, you know, I personally, you know, I love both those bands, you yeah. know, Fish and the Dead, and it seems like very few other people like them both. Like, mm -hmm. I, I was wondering why you think it, it was such a controversial choice. Well, I, I think it's, it's a passionate fan base as much as any that has ever been. And they sort of have their, their golden gods <laughs> within both their communities. And one is no longer with us and one is really this prime right now. And so I think there's a, a bit of a resistance from the dead, dead crew to, to really just embrace this person and, and, and from the fish crew to think that there's somehow some sort of selling out going on or whatever it is. It's, I, I, I take more from the great artists like Steve Kimock or John Kavlicek, who have lots of experience playing with them, and those are excellent guitar players who said, oh, that's a great idea, that guy's amazing. And I think that uh, what, I, what I take from that whole scene, I, I, I just, I've been part of both. I've been to lots of Grateful Dead shows, I've been to lots of Fish shows. I, I too love both bands and all that they uh, have been able to build and being in a band for lots of years have nothing but respect for their longevity. 
Um, and I feel like I, I, I had a unique perspective being a uh, total head at Shoreline with my head down, kind of, you know, dancing away, not even thinking about playing music, just being part of the musical experience. And then also being in big festival sets and seeing people doing the same while I've been playing. So I really, I felt like I could speak to what I thought was cool about the, the call in a way as I mentioned certain song choices I thought would be really cool to hear them play. And, and then on top of that, I just think it's a very inspired choice. I, I, I felt it was, Knowing Trey as much as I do musically, I, I think he's going to respect the hell out of it. And he's going to go out there and forge his sounds to be, you know, fitting each individual song and uh, really learn certain solos. I mentioned, you know, the Slipknot. He's going to slay that. He's going to kill it. And people, all the, all the Grateful Dead haters are going to be like, thank <laughs> God that was awesome. That's my prediction. We'll see. Let's have this conversation <laughs> yeah. in uh, August. And right. uh, But I, I'm sure rooting for everybody. And, and, and in this business, you know, I, I don't like it when people have sort of feelings of, of, of negativity towards each other. It's, it's completely pointless. It really is. And and uh, there's room for everybody to be great. And we, we really want to, to see that in Hop Out of Rum World, to see, you know, and enjoy being music fans and, and musicians and, and try to just have as much fun and, and, and as little vitriol as possible. Yeah. <coughs>